Welcome. This is a hearing uh, entitled Fulfilling a Legal Duty, Triggering a Medicare Plan from the Administration. I would ask the first uh, witness in a panel by himself to uh, uh, come forward. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. We'll read the uh, mission statement from, from the Oversight Committee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes from them as, them as well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I will uh, recognize myself for an opening statement and then recognize the uh, distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, not just the first panel of witnesses, but all the witnesses uh, for their time and willingness to share their insights, as well as thank um, all the guests in the audience. As part of the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement Modernization Act of 2003, Congress enacted a trigger provision, a statutory requirement to propose Medicare reforms should certain conditions be met. Each year, the Medicare trustees are required to include a Medicare funding warning in their annual report should general revenue funding exceed 45 percent of total Medicare revenue for the current year or is projected to exceed 45 percent for the subsequent six years. Should that warning be issued in consecutive years, the trigger mechanism would take effect requiring the President to submit legislation to Congress that would decrease the percentage of general revenue financing Medicare. Since 2006, every single annual report has included this warning. The previous administration complied with this law. The current administration has not. And that is troubling on at least two fronts. Firstly, and fundamentally, we are a nation of laws. We don't have the luxury of picking and choosing which laws we like and which laws we do not like. The law is no respecter of title or station. It applies to all. So it is troubling the President, who is the chief executive of the branch charged with enforcing the laws, has not complied. And this failure to comply is troubling because we are witnessing firsthand right now the need for decisive leadership on the tough spending issues facing our country. Making speeches isn't hard. Saying you have a plan when you don't have a plan isn't hard. What is hard is leading. What is hard is making tough decisions. That is what is statutorily and indeed morally required of leaders. Without substantive reform, Medicare will be insolvent in a decade. Costs are skyrocketing and, skyrocketing and benefits are threatened by the unsustainable status quo. Something has to be done, and simply talking about the problems will no longer suffice. Abdicating this duty might be a good political strategy. It is not a good strategy for this country. We can hope for the leadership to resolve this difficult issue. That we can hope for. What we should never be forced to hope for is compliance with the law, hence this hearing. I now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you, first of all, for holding this very important hearing. As a matter of fact, this is an issue that I care deeply about and for many different reasons. For more than 45 years, Medicare has successfully provided access to health services for the elderly, ages 65 and over, and non-elderly people with disabilities. It currently covers 47 million Americans. Just think about it, 47 million Americans. Since July 30, 1965, when Lyndon Johnson signed the bill creating this fundamental health initiative, this program has evolved to reliably meet the demands of aging and medically vulnerable Americans who may not have had access to medical attention otherwise. Simply put, Medicare is a lifeline. Given the political realities, I realize that certain well thought out improvements need to be made for Medicare to continue its course. 
However, make no mistake, I, along with my Democratic colleagues, am committed to ensuring the viability and sustainability of Medicare without deep ideological driven cuts with harmful consequences. It is this same commitment that ensured that Congress worked actively for comprehensive health reform. The passage of the Affordable Care Act further improved upon the fiscal efficiencies necessary to ensure Medicare's continued existence. On a personal note, I have been involved in health advocacy for over 35 years. I believe it fundamentally reveals the character of a nation when it cares for its most vulnerable citizens, the elderly and the infirmed. In my district, I can attest that Medicare serves as an indispensable safety net for many of my constituents. This discussion is a valid one, but it must be approached in a serious, thoughtful manner, mindful of the sacrifices made by those who came before us. Seniors should not bear the burden of cost shifting disguised as reform. I look forward to the testimony of all the witnesses. And I will just end, uh, Mr. Chairman, by suggesting that if it was not for Medicare, many of the senior citizens that I personally know probably would not still be around, because oftentimes Medicare is the only stopgap between them and the grave. So if we talk about safety nets, there is nothing that can provide more safety than the opportunity for individuals who have reached an age where they cannot necessarily care for themselves to know that at the end of the day they can get the medical services that they need. I look forward to the hearing and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. We now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for uh, calling this hearing today. And I want to pick up where the ranking member of this subcommittee left off. As the son of a mother who is 85 years old, I just watched her struggle through the difficulty of seeing her doctor retire and trying to help her find a new doctor. She found a new doctor, but even that was very taxing on her at 85 years old. To pick up where Mr. Davis left off, um, and when I meet with people in my district, the seniors, and I ask them, uh, you know, who has savings and who has uh, pensions and whatever, and most of them, all, all they have is Social Security and Medicare. That's it, period. So to put it more bluntly, it, without Medicare, they would be, many of them would be dead, period. There are 45 million people nationwide who depend on Medicare for health, their health care. For them and for millions of seniors who will come after them, it is vital that Congress ensure Medicare's long-term insolvency. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act extended the Medicare Trust Fund solvency by eight years, which is one of the many reasons I am proud that I voted to enact this law, and I will go to my grave defending it. By providing free preventative screenings and reducing the cost of brand name prescription drugs, the Affordable Care Act has already made a tremendous impact on seniors' health care and their pocketbooks. The Affordable Care Act also addresses the escalating cost of health care by reforming Medicare's payment and delivery system to incentivize high quality, better coordinated care to root out inefficiencies and to fight fraud and abuse. In contrast, the recent plan passed by my House Republican friends would eliminate Medicare as we know it. In a radical transformation, they would wipe out Medicare's guaranteed benefits for seniors. They would also shift massive costs onto seniors while doing nothing to address the real reasons behind a uh, high cost of health care. Under the Republican plan, seniors age 65 and 66 would be abandoned to find health care on their own or go without it. Seniors 67 and older would uh, get a voucher 
from the government to pay a smaller and smaller share of their health care costs. But one of the questions that I have posed to so many, and I have never received a satisfactory answer, Mr. Chairman, is that if I have a senior at 65 years old with diabetes and its companion heart disease, who is going to insure them? I don't care how much money you got. Who is going to insure them? The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office estimated that the Republican plan would, would more than double out-of-pocket costs for seniors. Right now, seniors pay about 25 to 30 percent. Under the Republican plan, they would pay 68 percent, with no money, by the way. The Center for Economic Policy Research calculates that the Republican plan would shift costs of up to $4.9 trillion on to seniors for the individual senior citizen that would amount to an average of $13,368 per year. Mr. Chairman, the Republican plan is a cruel and it is sadly a cruel and betrayal of our Nation's seniors. It would have a profoundly negative impact on the health of those elderly. It would be detrimental to the Nation's economy and it would impair the living standards of seniors and their children who will be called upon to take over when the government abandons them. This radical plan, now that's, and again, I go back to if they can get insurance. Uh, this radical plan is not inevitable, and Democrats in Congress will fight tooth and nail to help protect our Nation's seniors from this uh, ab abomination. At the same time, we will seek common sense measures to curb runaway medical inflation rather than taking away medical care from people who need it. And I agree with the ranking member. There are things that have to be done with regard to Medicare. Nobody is saying it is sort of the one way or the highway, but we have to do those things that are sensible. And we have to do those things. We have to treat this as if we are the most skilled heart surgeon uh, uh, performing the most delicate operation so that we do the treatment and give the reform that will allow Medicare to live as opposed to allow the patient to die. And so I look forward to the testimony today. I want to thank our witnesses. And again, Mr. Chairman, I think this is a grand opportunity for us to uh, address this issue. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Maryland. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jonathan Bloom, who is the Deputy Administrator and Director of Center for Medicare and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, pursuant to committee policy, I would ask uh, Mr. Bloom to uh, please rise and let me administer an oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give this committee to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? May the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Bloom, there are a series of lights, um, hopefully, somewhere. Um, they mean what they traditionally mean. And, outside of committee hearings. So uh, with that, we would uh, recognize you for your uh, five-minute statement. Great. Thank you, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, um, and, and members of the committee. I am pleased to be here today to talk about our efforts to strengthen the Medicare program. I would like to make three main points during my five minutes. First, the Affordable Care Act has made substantial improvements to Medicare's overall finances. The Affordable Care Act will reduce Medicare spending by over $500 billion over the next 10 years. Many of the savings provisions included in the Affordable Care Act came from proposals that were part of the President's first budget submission to Congress in 2009. These proposals included a, a, a payment changes to, to promote accountable care organizations to participate within the Medicare program bundled payments to, to promote greater care coordination and greater e efficiency to our payments, payment reductions to, to certain health care providers, and incentives for hospitals to improve quality. Many of these savings provisions have been already implemented, so the savings are real, and CMS is on track to implement the remaining savings provisions on time. This year's Medicare Trustees Report confirmed the Affordable Care Act's impact on the program's overall solvency. The Part A trust fund solvency has been extended by eight years. The 45 percent trigger thr threshold will be met by 2013. Projected per capita spending will be 2.9 percent over the next 10 years, significantly lower than the previous 10 years. The cost curve, at least in the short run, has been bent downward. 
Not only do these changes reduce taxpayers' burdens, but they lower costs for Medicare beneficiaries through lower copayments and premiums. The, the second point that I want to make today is, is that reducing Medicare costs is one of CMS's greatest priorities, highest priorities. We have made significant new investments in reducing waste, fraud, and abuse. Through our partnerships with law enforcement agencies, billions of dollars have been recovered back to the trust funds. We have also implemented on January 1st the first round of competitive bidding for medical supplies such as power wheelchairs. Through this competitive bidding program, Medicare will pay an average of 32 percent less than it previously paid for power wheelchairs, oxygen tanks, and other durable equipment. That 32 percent is an average figure. The program will save billions of dollars for taxpayers and beneficiaries when fully phased in. We have also closed loopholes and reformed our payment systems to ensure that we pay accurately for providers such as skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, and physician services. CMS will continue to use its rulemaking authorities to ensure we pay as accurately and fairly as possible. And the third point that I would like to make today is that Medicare benefits are stronger due to the Affordable Care Act and our work at CMS. The Medicare Part D donor hole is being phased out by 2020, and this year those that do fall into the donor hole will save hundreds of dollars on their out-of-pocket costs for, for, for prescription drugs. This year the program began to offer free cost sharing for certain preventive benefits to keep seniors healthier for longer periods of time. And the Medicare Advantage program continues to grow, not shrink, but to grow while, while offering average lower premiums. Clearly, we have more work to do to ensure a sustainable program for the long-term future. We look forward to working with the Congress to ensure we have the strongest program possible. I would be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bloom. Um, I would say on behalf of all of us, uh, votes are imminent, and uh, all of us want to be good stewards of your time as well as the time for the second panel. I know that there people have other commitments and other things to do. So we are going to ask questions until they call for votes, and then um, if, uh, if we get back in time and you are still here, great. Um, if not, then um, we want to be respectful of things other people have. So. Thank you. We apologize for that in advance. Mr. Bloom, what is the purpose of the trigger? The, uh, the, the 45 percent trigger? That is right. Well, the MMA, um, the Medicare Modernization Act of, of 2003, created a kind of additional solvency measure uh, to, 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 to assess the overall financing of uh, the total Medicare program, Parts A and, and Parts B. And it requires the President to submit a plan to Congress, correct? The, the statute uh, requires that, that, the, uh, that the Medicare trustees issue a, uh, a, a funding warning uh, when, when certain conditions have been met. Have those conditions been met? They were met starting as of 2006 or 2007. Right. So according to Federal law, President Obama was supposed to submit a plan to this Congress to flip that 45 percent of ge general revenue funding for Medicare, correct? The, the 45 percent trigger has been met, will, will be met by 2013. The Affordable Care Act that, will. That, that wasn't my question. The President has consistently submitted a uh, budget. To propose, to propose reductions to overall Medicare's financing. In 2009, the President submitted a, a historic budget framework to reduce So he does not take the position that it is advisory. He, he takes the position that it is the law? I think, I think that the position that the administration takes is that uh, re re reducing Medicare costs is one of our highest priorities in the context uh, of uh, Mr. Bloom, I am not asking you about priorities. I am asking you about compliance with the law. Does this administration take the position that the trigger is advisory or mandatory? We take the position that, um, that reducing Medicare costs is our highest priority. The Affordable Mr. Care Bloom, Act. Mr. Bloom, I am probably not asking my question very artfully. Uh, so let me try it again. Is the trigger mandatory or discretionary, complying with it? 
The trigger is one, um, one measure of overall Medicare solvency. The President has proposed a, 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 proposed a budget in, in 2009. Many of those savings provisions were included within the Affordable Care Act and adopted in the Affordable so Care Act. So your position is the, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare meets his requirements under that section for the trigger? Um, my position today is that the, the President has continued to propose um, ideas and proposals to reduce Medicare spending. Can, as a result, by 2013, in two years' time, the 45 percent threshold has been met. Mr. Bloom, I quit counting at number seven when I heard for the seventh time my colleagues refer to the Republican plan. And, and that's, that's great. They can, that, that's the beautiful part about our Republic is that we can introduce ideas and criticize them, and heavens knows Paul Ryan's plan has certainly been scrutinized and criticized. I, I wonder if the President's decision not to submit a plan to fix Medicare might be because he had the, the prescience to realize that there would be criticism that came, just like Mr. Ryan has experienced. You think that might explain why we haven't gotten a plan submitted to Congress? I think the President. Uh, since, since he took office, has said that reducing Medicare costs, overall health care costs, is one of our greatest uh, uh, challenges in the context of overall health care reform. The President submitted a budget in 2009 that, will reduce, that, uh, um, that would have reduced Medicare spending by $300 billion. Many of those provisions were adopted in the Affordable Care Act. And as what about result, 2010? He, he continues to suggest new ideas, for example, to reduce uh, waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, this April, he, he proposed in the context of the overall debt ceiling reductions for $400 billion, additional reduction for, for both Medicare and Medicaid, and he has continued to, to suggest new ideas in the context of the overall debt ceiling discussions. Mr. Blue, I'm going to ask you again. Do you take the position that Obamacare meets the statutory requirements of the trigger legislation? My position is that due to the uh, savings provisions that were included in the Affordable Care Act, Medicare solvency has been increased by eight years. The 45 percent trigger will be met by 2013 in two years' time through at least 2020. Um, what I think is uh, uh, true is that the Affordable Care Act will reduce Medicare spending, will improve Medicare solvency. We have more work to do, um, but, um, but by 2013, the 45 percent trigger will be met. So you, that's a long way to say you do take the position that introducing or passing Obamacare uh, absolves you from having to meet any other trigger requirements. I think the President has been clear that we have much more work to do to ensure Medicare solvency. Well, I'm wondering if part of that work might be complying with the law and yes. submitting a plan to Congress as is required when you get warnings from, from the trustees. In the, I believe that the first year that the warning was, um, was issued was in 2006, possibly 2006 or 2006, 2007. The first year the President took office, he, he submitted a, a proposal to the Congress to reduce Medicare spending by $300 billion. The Affordable Care Act uh, took, those took many of those proposals to reduce spending by $500 billion. We are working very hard to implement those provisions. We have extended th those provisions have extended solvency by eight years for the Part A trust fund. By 2013, the, the trigger has been met through at least 2020. So, so I believe we are uh, we have complied with the intent to the 45 percent trigger. Well, I'm uh, way out of time, so I will uh, recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bloom, I'm aware that we're searching for alternatives to reform Medicare. The Ryan Plan is one such scenario, but I'm not in favor of merely shifting beneficiaries from one Federal plan to another. The Congressional Budget Office said the following about the Ryan Plan, and I'm actually quoting. As the eligibility age for Medicare rose from 65 to 67, some people who were 65 or 66 years old or were approaching those ages would turn to other programs for health care and income support. For example, more people might apply for disability benefits under the disability insurance program or 
under the Supplemental Security Income Program. Most people on disability insurance receive Medicare benefits after a 24-month waiting period, and Supplemental Security Income beneficiaries receive Medicaid benefits immediately under current law. Most people might also apply for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or other welfare programs. Is it reasonable to believe that under the Ryan Plan, seniors will be forced to rely on other public health programs or simply not obtain those services at all? Uh, my reading of the Congressional Budget Office analysis of, of um, Congressman or Chairman Ryan's plan is that it would uh, shift additional costs onto uh, Medicare beneficiaries. That the way the program is structured, uh, to my understanding, it, is that it sets a uh, premium support system that grows over time um, by, a, by an amount less than the overall projected trend rate in, in health care costs, and as a result, um, that, that shifts costs onto Medicare beneficiaries relative to what they would have paid without, without the proposal. And, and it is also my understanding that the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office found that a typical beneficiary would spend more for health care under the proposal than under CBO's long-term scenarios for several reasons. First, private plans would cost more than traditional Medicare because of the net effect of differences in payment rate for providers administrative costs and utilization of health care services as described above. Second, the government's contribution would grow more slowly than health costs, leaving beneficiaries with more to pay. Uh, is that your understanding of, of, of this scenario? Uh, correct. I think that you look at the history of private plans operating within the Medicare program, they have uh, historically uh, not been uh, less expensive than the traditional fee-for-service Medicare program. Today we spend about 108 percent on average more for private plans for those beneficiaries who join a private plan relative to the traditional fee-for-service program. Now, th those, those payment differentials are coming down, um, but I think one of the points from the Congressional Budget Office is that um, they estimate that the cost to administer health care coverage through private plans relative to the fee-for-service program would be more expensive. And that is one of the reasons why beneficiaries would be projected to pay more than they would um, without the new program put into place. In your analysis, would you suggest that the Affordable Care Act actually helps to reduce the cost of Medicare? The Affordable Care Act reduces Medicare beneficiaries' out-of-pocket costs in a number of ways. One is that it constrains cost growth, so to the effect that pro the, the program pays less, beneficiaries pay less through lower copayments and lower premiums. The Affordable Care Act also phases out the so-called Part D donut hole. Uh, this year, beneficiaries will save hundreds of dollars in out-of-pocket costs for brand-name prescription drugs, and also that the program uh, provides free cost sharing for certain preventive benefits. Um, so, yes, the Affordable Care Act will lower out-of-pocket costs um, relative to, to previous law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Illinois. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Blum, for appearing today. Uh, just in continuation of the conversation we were just having, you are talking about lowering uh, health care costs under Obamacare plan for Medicare recipients. Uh, does the plan take into account the fact that there are 10,000 new Medicare recipient, recipients entering the uh, Medicare pool daily? Uh, does it take into account the fact that the average life expectancy now versus 1965 has uh, grown by about 10 years? I believe the average life expectancy in 65 was 68 for a male, and it's, it's much higher now, thankfully. Uh, the, the CBO says that it will be insolvent by 2024. With, with all those considerations, is that all uh, covered in the Affordable Health Care Act, and is, is that going to be taken care of in terms of still being able to lower costs despite this huge influx? Sure. And the CBO will report that uh, Medicare is going to be insolvent. 
Well, the trustees' report that I cited during my opening statement projected that, that uh, Medicare trust fund solvency will be, be increased by eight years, that the 45 percent trigger will, will be met by 2013 per capita spending will um, be constrained relative, uh, over the next 10 years relative to the previous 10 years. Those projections also include the fact that, that beneficiaries live longer, um, the, the fact that, that more beneficiaries due to the baby boom generation will be added to the program. So the figures that I cited take into account the uh, demographic changes that are projected to happen to the Medicare program. Okay. And as a practicing physician who is taking care of many Medicare patients, do you believe that we can reduce the cost the, the way you speak here and maintain quality of care? I think one of the greatest uh, challenges and also opportunities that is contained within the Affordable Care Act is the opportunities to use payment reform to change how we uh, think about paying for care, to shift from paying for uh, shift to paying for value, from paying for volume. The Affordable Care Act includes many provisions to make our health care system safer, more focused on outcomes. For example, focusing on hospital readmissions. So, I mean, the the spirit of the Affordable Care Act is to um, uh, constrain cost growth in part by lowering payment updates to providers, but also to fundamentally change how we think about paying for care, to focus on the value, to focus on the outcome, rather than just the, just the volume of services. What is it going to do with the SGR? Because that is a looming issue uh, that concerns both the recipients of health care, because seniors are already having difficulty finding providers, okay. and providers seem to be exiting the Medicare plan because of the cost cuts. Right now we have a anywhere from a 21 to 28 percent cut. Uh, does your plan uh, inc include a 30 percent pay cut to providers? Uh, Congressman, you are correct. According to our current projections, that if Congress uh, does not extend the so-called um, um, SGR um, extensions that CMS will have to reduce physician payments by 30 percent. Uh, we, we are very concerned about this, uh, this uh, projected uh, um, payment reduction. And while we don't see any disruptions to access to phys physician services across the country right now, we are concerned that physician access could be compromised if this cut were to take into effect. The President has called for a, for a, for a permanent fix to the SGR one that's also fiscally responsible. How are we going to pay for that? I mean, what are we going to tell our seniors right now, don't worry, we're going to cut physicians' pay by another 30 percent when essentially there hasn't been a pay increase for a decade now, despite rising health care costs, overhead costs, and physicians are going to be uh, paid probably 50 percent less than they were a decade ago. Uh, do you really think that's going to fly? Or can you tell our seniors with any confidence that doctors are going to be there for them? And, and what uh, does the Obama administration have as a solution okay. for this? Well, I can't, um, I can't speak for the Congress, um, but the President this year in his 2012 budget submission proposed a, a two-year extension that was fully paid for uh, through, through payment reduction, through, uh, through improvements to how we think about waste, fraud and abuse within the Medicare program. Um, but the President has also called for a, a permanent solution, but one that is also done in a fiscally responsible way. That so we are going to kick the can down the road? I think, I, think, I think what the President has said is that we need to find a, a permanent solution working with the Congress. Um, his, his budget submission uh, this year uh, it included a two-year extension. But, 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 but his policy, his very strong policy preference is for a permanent fix to the SGR. Okay. So we will worry about when we get there is basically what I am hearing. Let us talk about IPAB quickly because we are running out of time. That is another area that I think you, maybe even the administration recommends flawed. We have an independent payment advisory board that is basically tasked with rationing health care, even though they are saying that they are not allowed to ration it. But they are tasked with cutting Medicare. And I find it interesting that the Ryan plan has been accused of uh, ending Medicare as we know it, in, in reality, Obamacare within the next two years is going to start making drastic cuts in payments to Medicare recipients and providers, and I see a recipe for disaster. Well, I think Bloom, the overall, uh, Mr. Bloom, the gentleman's time has expired, but I don't want to prevent you from answering. I would just ask you to answer in light of the fact that the gentleman's time has expired. Thank, Thank you. you. I think that the, um, the overall goal it, that we have, that I think all of us have, is that to ensure that, 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 that cost growth remains lower than, than, than the past. And I think one of the reasons that Congress did include the IPAP provision was to create a check on overall per capita growth. 
Um, in my opinion, we need to look at a whole host of uh, different solvency measures. The 45 percent trigger looks at the mix of financing, but it doesn't necessarily look at the overall cost growth. And I think that we, um, I think that the Affordable Care Act's goal, CMS's goal, is, is to ensure that we have uh, lower cost growth in the past to ensure the program remains affordable both for taxpayers and for beneficiaries. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chairman, I see that we are about to start voting on the floor, so I will be brief. Uh, let me uh, ask you, Mr. Bloom, you know, one of the things about the Affordable Care Act, and, one of the, and it's something that my seniors applaud, is the whole idea of wellness. I cannot tell you the number of people that I see in my district who uh, call me and say, Cummings, you know, I found out I had prostate cancer, and they said it was too late. Too late. In other words, they didn't get the exam earlier. Or they found out they have some other disease that is uh, going to cost a lot, end-of-life care. Um, and I was wondering, as you all see it, the Affordable Care Act had provisions to try to uh, address some of the costs by keeping people well. Is that correct? The Affordable Care Act included several provisions, uh, one of which was for the first time to add the opportunity uh, for Medicare beneficiaries to have an annual wellness visit, a conversation with their physician to ensure that they are uh, complying with recommended preventive tests, to check medications, to ensure that the mix of medications is correct. Um, almost one million Medicare beneficiaries to date has taken advantage of, of that new wellness visit. The Affordable Care Act also um, included provisions to lower barriers for beneficiaries to take advantage of preventive benefits by, by waiving the cost sharing uh, for, for certain preventive benefits. And I think that in our opinion at CMS is that we need to keep our beneficiaries healthier for longer periods of time. That is the right thing to do for beneficiaries, but it is the right thing to do for overall Medicare costs. We know that when beneficiaries come on to the program without coverage, they cost, they cost more than beneficiaries who do that have coverage turning age 65. So that gives us evidence that when we focus on the health, we focus on the well-being, we ensure that beneficiaries receive care when they need it, that the overall costs are, are lower. If you will recall, when I uh, did my opening statement, I talked about a question that uh, concerns me and I am sure many others. Uh, if you got a senior who is 65 years old with no, who has diabetes and who has heart disease, uh, I asked the question, who is going to insure them? And I wanted, the, and I am sure you all have tried to figure this out because you realize that there is a, a Republican plan. And so under that plan, do you, have you figured out who is going to insure those folks? Because I have got a lot of folks in similar situations in my district. Well, the plan, I understand it, the uh, Chairman Ryan's plan would take effect in uh, 2022. I think it is hard to predict which, mm -hmm. which insurance companies would come into a market in, uh, in more than 10 years' time. Um, but I think uh, the keys are to have very strong risk adjustment you know, mechanisms to ensure that plans have very strong incentives. Um, to take those that have chronic illness, chronic sick. Um, the history of the private plan system within the Medicare program to date has been that when we don't, don't account for the high cost that beneficiaries with diabetes or other chronic conditions have, that plans figure out ways not to care for them. The, uh, you talked about waste, fraud and abuse, uh, and that has been certainly a subject that has come before our full committee quite a bit and is something that we are tasked with addressing. And you know, do you all see a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse in the Medicare system? And do you, you know, that those are words that we hear over and over again. I mean, every year, I've been hearing it for the last 15 years since I've been here: waste, fraud, and abuse, waste, fraud, and abuse. The question is, um, do we have a a plan to truly attack that? I think um, in in 2009. Uh, there was a historic um, uh, coming together of both CMS and the law enforcement agencies, Department of Justice, of you know, trying to do more than what was done in the past to reduce true fraud in the program. 
One thing that was um, put into place is Operation Heat, which targets is both law enforcement resources and also analytic resources to the hot spots of the country uh, for for Medicare fraud. We know that fraud is, you know, tends to be in certain parts of the country. Then it moves when when law enforcement moves in. So the key really is to um, follow the hot spots and ensure that the fraudsters don't get ahead of uh, law enforcement. Second is that we are using data analytics in novel new ways to, to both uh, find waste, fraud, and abuse, but also to predict where waste, fraud, and abuse could be happening. And the third area is that we need to make sure that our payment policies are correct. They don't overinflate to create create incentives for um, fraudsters or um, or um, bad actors to come into the program. One example is that we have reduced uh, uh, prices paid for certain durable medical equipment. That, that's an area that we have had a lot of fraud in the program by 32 percent. So if we target the hotspots, we use data wisely. We also set our payment policies right. That that we will make a serious dent in waste, fraud, and abuse. Thank you, Madam Yoban. Thank the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. Bloom, and to my colleagues, uh, Mr. Clay, Ms. Holmes, Norton, uh, Dr. Gozar. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left to vote. It looks like it may be a series of some length. Uh, what I can promise you is we'll be back here as quickly as we can get back here. Uh, if I'm happy to stay. Well, I, I, we all apologize, uh, but we we can't control. Uh, when votes are called and, and sometimes can't control how long they last. But uh, make you the commitment, we'll get back here. I'm not going to tell you we're going to run, but we'll walk <laughs> briskly to get back here. And, uh, it's too hot to run. We'll be in recess uh, until such time as we can come back. And again, we apologize for any inconvenience. Right, thank you very much.